the older somebody gets, the less we visit them. They become,、mm. you know, it's a harsh reality, but it's true. And that's their that's their hold to their family. And in letting go of these things, it's letting go of a piece of their heart. That's a struggle when it comes to downsizing. My name is Kevin McIntosh, and this is the closing table where we talk to experts about their experience in real estate all across the country. Let's go. Welcome back to the closing table. I am your host. Kevin C. McIntosh, and per usual, we have another top producing real estate agent joining us today, and we want to welcome Krista Madrid to the closing table. How are you, Krista? I'm good, Kevin. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I appreciate your energy and your presence, and thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to be a guest on the closing table. We appreciate that. I'm honored. Thank you. All right, let's get to the nitty gritty. We want to talk about real estate, but before we get into real estate in your market, let's talk about who you are first and foremost. Let's let the people know why you are a professional and why you are important. But I want to take sixty seconds or less first to talk about who is Krista outside of real estate.、Please. Krista outside of real estate is I am、um, a mom. I am a grandma. I、um, am a friend. I've got a fly、mm-hmm. floating around me. Sorry about that.、Um, <laughs> I like to be active. I like to hike. I like to work out. I like to write poetry. I、um, I like to read. I like to be alone.、Um, but funny that I like to be alone because I love to be around people too. Hmm. Interesting. I'm kind of the same way. That's kind of interesting. I'm like an introverted introvert. Yes. Did I say not, that right? I'm pretty sure I didn't say that right. I don't think there's a word for us. <laughs> right. <laughs> Good though. I can I can relate to that. That's great to hear that I'm not the only one. Okay. So Krista,、uh, you you spoke on this briefly before I think off the air, but let's get into where you service currently. I got a question for you to describe your market, but it's a two part question. One, describe it geographically. Give as much details to the area, notable、uh, landmarks, attractions, things to do, etc. Paint that picture. For people who may have never been to your market, okay. Second part: get into the real estate stats,、uh, data, information that you have for us in regards to your market. All right. So first and foremost, I service the Denver metro area. That includes、um, several counties. Several. I could drive easily through seven counties in one day, just doing normal、mm-hmm. stuff, much less real estate stuff.、Um, mm-hmm. I also serve outside the metro area. I have been as far as seventy-two miles.、Um, Northwest in what they call Berthoud, beautiful area. I have been two hours northeast of me, which is Brush, Colorado. I have sold in Pueblo, Colorado, and I've done consultations in Trinidad, Colorado, where I'm from.、Um, the Denver metro market.、Um, we are,、um, and I'm seeing this all over Colorado. I'm hearing it from other agents as well, but.、Um, We're in a unique position right now as far as market stats go because it's kind of controlled by the interest rates. People are really freaking out over this seven percent interest rate,、um, mm-hmm. and every time the interest rate increases by a point, it changes your buying power. It decreases your buying power by about fifty thousand dollars on average. So people who are searching originally for, let's say, a five hundred thousand dollar home, unfortunately, in this market due to high demand and low inventory,、um, that's Even below the median entry price,、um, but let's just、mm. use five hundred thousand for easy numbers.、Um, if they're originally searching for that, now that we're at around seven percent interest rates, they're now searching for four hundred thousand dollar homes, very different caliber of home, and、um, that could make or break their house hunting options. What I always tell people is find a home, marry the home, date the rate. You can always refinance later. It, Um, some lenders are doing various things to get the buyers into these homes, where they're offering complimentary refinancing, or they're not charging their commission into the loan costs, or、um, mm. we're asking buyers are now asking sellers for concessions to buy down the rates.、Um, we have VA buyers. It's always tough for VA buyers because their right as、um, a serviceman to our country is to put zero down on a home. 
Well, not all home sellers mm -hmm. see that. That would require concessions mm -hmm. in any market. Not all sellers um, agree with that. They are married to money that's not yet in their pocket. But this is yeah. a great market for our VA buyers right now, too. Um, another thing I do to talk buyers off the ledge of continuing on a renting path is most of the time we meet at a Starbucks or a coffee house or something for a consultation. They're putting that coffee on their credit card. Their credit cards are only like 20% and higher. That credit yeah. card is not going to give you anything back, maybe a little few dollars on cash back uh, if you yeah. spend enough. But you're not getting anything back on that. So even at 7%, that's an investment in you. Your home is going to appreciate and it's going to give back to you. It's a matter of changing the perspective of your thoughts. Correct, correct, correct. Well put. I love the way that you put that, Krista. Like that makes a lot of sense. I mean, yeah, you wanna you wanna marry the house and date the rate, but you wanna actually make sure it's still within your monthly budget. I like the way you broke it down with the the points and the interest. Uh, uh, what did you say? Like a half percentage point or just one point one could point. make the difference between a 50, oh, no, please. Yep. 50,000. So that can go from you looking for a $500,000 home, like you said, to uh, about $400,000, you know, easily just because of the interest rates. But at the same time, you'll probably still be paying about the same that you would just based off that interest rate, you know, with a $500,000 home. So well, I have a great, great perspective. For that. Um, if okay. you're looking to refinance and you do go with the lender who's willing to give you a complimentary refinance, let's say you are comfortable with that house payment. Um, at $500,000, we are looking possibly, depending on what you put down, we're looking anywhere from $2,500 about on average um, on a monthly. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're comfortable with that monthly of $2,500 but you're not comfortable with that 7% interest rate. When interest rates fall, or let's say you run into a, a little bit of money where you can buy down your interest rate, then you refinance. You stay at the 2,500 that you're comfortable with and refinance for a shorter duration of time because that's mm. automatically going to bring your rate down too. And it just gets better from there the more dollars you put into it. Agree, agree. Well said. Thank you for that, Krista. We appreciate that. You, Since you are in the Denver market, Denver area, that's very close in proximity to the Rocky Mountains. We might as well just say it, it is the Rocky Mountains, essentially. <laughs> it is, yes. High plains. Yeah. Right. So with that being said, I would imagine that that would be some type of an attraction for some people. So can you describe a time where you had some clients that were looking for maybe a vacation home, a second home in those, the mountain areas? And can you talk about how you guided them through actually finding that property? I um, have had clients looking for vacation homes, second homes, um, entertainment homes, investment homes, if you will. There's a lot of money to be made as investments. Um, a mm -hmm. lot of people love the mountains, summer, winter, you name it, various reasons to be there. However, I don't service the mountains. Those are a very niche market. They have- Really? Uh, yes, yes, um, very niche, very luxurious in some cases, not all, but in most mm -hmm. cases. And there are, Mountain living is very different from average, everyday metropolitan living. So we hand off to agents who are um, specialized in those areas. Who, I wouldn't want somebody kind of winging it with me if I were buying a home or a car or anything important. I don't want to be the one winging it with my clients either. I'm going to hand them off to a specialist. Huh. Interesting. Now we have to explore that, Krista, because I'm wondering what factors go into a property that's in the mountains makes it so much different from a home that's just in the metro area. Um, Why does that require a certain uh, agent? It w would require a certain agent because um, price point, it's a different loan. Um, okay. It's, mm. You're also in an area where you may not have the luxury of um, public water, public um, sewer lines, uh, we're now dealing with um, mountain specific utilities, if you will. Um, same mm. with just regular utilities. Um, you know, are you on a grid? You're likely on a grid. Sometimes you're off grid. How's the power? How often does the power go out? Even down to internet services. Some areas are so um, desolate that the internet providers, there's not a lot out there. Um, and in 
cases where I have helped people like literally in the foothills of the mountains, like Conifer, Morrison areas, Bailey areas like that, the, li the internet connections are so limited because the providers are usually third party providers. For example, DISH. DISH is a great example. They have mm -hmm. um, a certain internet provider. Um, we actually go through the trouble of getting that service transferred from the current homeowner to the new homeowner before the deal is complete, before the sale is complete. The reason behind that is because if the new homeowner shuts off service, the or if the current homeowner shuts off service, the new homeowner may not be able to get service because they're now at the bottom of the line of a set of several waiting customers. Uh, oh, wow. Wow, wow, wow. It's crazy to see the, the priority that internet has made in our lives over the years. But yeah, I mean, that is essential. That is essential. But who would have, now that you put it in perspective, I understand that. Yeah, you're not going to have access to the same water that everyone else has, the electricity and things of that nature. You're placed in a different type of landscape. So yes. your, your entire state of living is, is slightly different. And, and, and it makes sense because what it requires to have residents in a mountain or on a mountain, or whatever the case may be, the structure and the foundation and everything around it is going to be completely different. Including completely the home different. maintenance. It's going to be that, different. Ooh. Ooh, good point. Oh, wow. Interesting. Thank you for that. Okay. Let's talk about a, a, a time where you had to, you had a property that has some type of unconventional feature layout, something that just wasn't normal, quote unquote. Can you talk about uh, how you were able to see the true potential and convince clients that this was actually a unique feature that they should take advantage of? Okay. I have an amazing property to reference for this. I had this beautiful 3,000 square foot sprawling home out in Watkins. That baby was on the market for two years. Two years? Um, Whoa. Yeah. So it was very unique, very open floor plan. And the reason it was so open is because at one time it was a show off home for um, some big executive big wigs at DIA. Um, it mm. had a swimming pool inside the home. And then um, it got forgotten nice. it got left behind the it had a lot of mess so they the the way to recover this home was to cover the pool they um, filled it in they covered it um, there were because it was a pool it was already a big open space so we're talking four bedrooms um, four bathrooms four full bathrooms not even a partial bathroom a beautiful mm. pool room slash library where they had a, a beyond big pool table. And then these crazy arched um, vaulted ceilings. Plus the property was so big, they had two solar systems on the property. Um, usually most homes get one solar system. This was so big it needed two solar systems to power the place. There was no gas in this place, no propane, um, no natural gas. It was completely powered by solar, with the exception of being wow. connected to the um, Excel grid. Plus, it was on one perfect square acre of land. This property, prior to becoming a show-off home, was owned by the United States Air Force. It was a bunker. Mm. It was a bomb bunker. <laughs> and um, they built onto the bunker. The bunker then became the garage. But this garage was so huge. You could fit one super long vehicle in inside the um, single car garage, but in the double, what looked like a double car garage, I drive a pretty big vehicle. I drive a, a Volkswagen Atlas. You could probably fit six of my car in what looked like that two car garage. Oh, wow. And because I was an Air Force bunker, that mm. baby's not going anywhere. I think everybody in the county would want to be there if a tornado hit. And it was situated in such an area that all the storms missed it. Hail missed it. Tornadoes missed it. It's just an amazing area. The Air Force was very specific when they create when they chose this spot to build that back in the yeah. 1940s. Hmm. And um, this, because it was owned by the Air Force, that particular one acre was unincorporated Arapahoe County, whereas everything around it, literally right outside the fence line, was Aurora. 
Very oh. interesting, very unique property. Um, it had um, also a septic system that was evaporative. It sat on top of the Denver Aquifer, so it tapped directly into the Denver Aquifer for well water. Um, just an amazing, beautiful, amazing property out in Watkins, seven miles from where I live, which is Metro Aurora, all by itself, sitting out there all by itself. Just the beauty and the serenity and wow. the views of the mountains. You could see all the way from Pike Peak to Long's Peak, unobstructed firework displays were amazing during 4th of July. I mean, talk mm. about all over the city all at once. Just amazing. Two years to sell that thing. And it, it's, um, when we that's did, what I was going to say. Two years? Two years because um, not everybody could see the potential of a solar system, much less two solar systems, and being out there all by themselves and, oh, just the serenity. So when we did get an offer, we ended up with two offers. We had competing offers, and um, mm. it sold with no issues. I mean, the roof was done. Um, everything was to par, and it was owned by somebody who was actually a former um, naval electrician or, or, you know, some kind of top Navy man who was very, very detailed in his home maintenance because that's the kind of life he grew up with and, and maintained right. during his adulthood. Yeah. Whoa, that was a mouthful. That is crazy. Just thinking about that, when you first described it, I'm thinking this is like an abandoned mansion. That's literally mm -hmm. what I'm thinking. I'm picturing a, a mansion and a mountain and it's abandoned. No. But clearly that wasn't the case. It just didn't sell for two years? Two years. How? <laughs> um, that's How? what we wondered. That's what we wondered. I even changed brokerages, um, not for the sale, but the people, mm -hmm. the sellers loved me so much because of all the efforts I put into selling this home. We held events there. We held a pumpkin patch there. We, um, mm. I hosted open house probably three times a month, if not more. I babysat the house for them when they were out of town. I mean, we're, what? this home Ooh. was, the lot was so amazing. They had a semi-sized fifth wheel or RV that they parked there. And then they had a fifth wheel and there's still room to spare. It, they had a shooting that range in the backyard. It was an awesome oh. property. <laughs> That sounds nice. Yeah, that's that's a little unconventional. You said it missed all the, the rain, the storms, the hell, and that's interesting. It was in the right to have a home where miss all that. Yeah, and we could thank oh, Air Force for that. Yeah, <laughs> man, that's nice. I actually want to see that house now. That sounds I'll interesting. Send you a link. Okay, okay, interesting. Thanks for that story. We appreciate that. I see that you're also a a senior resident specialist. Yes. Which means you basically have the certification to help uh, uh, seniors kind of do uh, downsize when downsize. you know when they're coming from a home, maybe going to a nursing home or condo, or whatever the case may sure. be. Can you talk about the time you helped the client downsize and the obstacles that you had to overcome? Um, yes. So downsizing somebody, especially a senior, it it can be tough. Most most people mm -hmm. are reasonable, but sometimes people get emotionally attached to sentimental items. And that's the biggest struggle because in most cases, that's the only tie, these sentimental material things are their only tie to their family because, you know, let's face it, we're all guilty of it. The older somebody gets, the less we visit them. They become, mm. you know, it's a harsh reality, but it's true. And that's their, yeah. that's their hold to their family. And in letting go of these things, it's letting go of a piece of their heart. That's a struggle when it comes to downsizing. Oh man, Crystal, why'd you have to say that? That hit I'm home. So sorry. I was no, I was literally just thinking about this. About you know, you know, when your parents or your grandparents get older and how much they look for to really love and appreciate when you give them a call or even go see them. I, I just recently saw my great grandmother. Recently, she was just so happy I saw her. Yeah. And and I was thinking about it like, like this is all that this is this is what you really take this is what you appreciate the most is people visiting you. And then I thought about it like people probably don't think to visit you know the older people or the seniors in their life. They're, they're so busy with their life and their day to day and take care of their family. They're not thinking about the ones that took care of them. 
So for your position to help those seniors who, you know, have that emotional attachment to their homes and, and go through different things with their family and you actually help them make those great life decisions. And I, I got to applaud you for that. And sift through these belongings, too. Not all agents are yeah. willing to do that. I sit there mm-hmm. and listen to the stories. They just want to be heard. They just want that visiting time. You know, exactly. that's precious to them, extremely mm-hmm. precious to them. And mm-hmm. they need to get that out. It's good for their heart. Yeah. And, and this is why I have learned throughout the our, our time here at the closing table that you play many different roles as a real estate agent, oh, yeah. a therapist uh, uh, or whatever you want to call it, uh, a friend more than anything, though. But that just goes to show that you have to you have to have, you know, build that rapport with your clients. It's more than just the closings. It's actually it's actual human beings going through things. It's not just so, selling real estate. That's a nice man. side effect. Oh, yeah. The, the pay oh, yeah. is a nice side effect, but it truly mm-hmm. is an industry of service. We are service people. If you are not a service person, this is not the industry for you. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. Yes, absolutely. Be a, You have to be a pupil's person mm-hmm. more than anything. Wow. Wow. Well said. Love that. Um, while you are out in your career, you're showing different properties and doing open houses and things like that. You may enter homes that, like you said, haven't been occupied for years. And then some certain situations can occur with that. Well, has there been a situation where you didn't feel safe entering a property or you entered a property and you saw something that made you feel unsafe with your clients? Can you talk about how you kind of manage that situation and what preventable measures you took going forward from there? Well, there have been a few, but I'll give you the most recent, which was earlier this spring. Um, Mm. Sometimes when an old person, elder person is selling their home, they don't drive. They don't see well. They, they just can't be as mobile as an everyday seller who makes right. the time to get out of the home. Sometimes they can't leave the home. Shame on some agents who tell their clients to stay out of the way. Shame, shame, shame on them. Because this, huh? this agent told this particular client, I was showing a home to an investor friend of mine um, in North, um, in North Hill, and um, or in Park Hill. I'm sorry. And we go into the home, and we're looking through the home. I mean, we're talking maybe 900 square feet of home, cute little brick place that needs some lifting up, which is why we had an investor in there. Mm-hmm. We're looking through everything. We could see that there's a lot of cleanup to do. Um, so we're opening closets. Oh my God. There was a man in the closet, scared the bejesus out of us. She ran, my client ran. I shut the door and held it shut. (laughs) Of course, I'm jittering on the inside. I'm like, who are you? What are you doing here? And he's like, I live here. I live here. My agent told me to stay out of the way. (laughs) Like, oh my God. I opened the door. Say, come on out. Come on out. This poor little old guy, he must have been early 70s. In hiding in the closet because his agent told him to stay out of the way. Oh my God. Name oh. <laughs> agent. That was scary. I mean, he ended up being a harmless fellow, but what if he wasn't? What if he wasn't? That, we have two women looking at this home, and all I've got on me is a tactical pen. I know how to use it thanks to my Watkins um, seller, the one I just described, that tough home to sell. Um, but I don't carry concealed. Um, my client yeah. doesn't carry concealed. Um, what, and what if I had carried concealed? What if I had shot this man? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, so many different things that could have went wrong with that situation. There's so many different things that's wrong with that. Mm-hmm. Like the agent telling them to do that, him yeah, actually is. doing it and hiding in a closet at a property that you own. Um, yes. Exactly. I wasn't ready for that. That was that was disturbing. It is very that disturbing. disturbing. Shame on those people. I have clients who can't leave the home um, because of um, restricted mobility for the same reasons. You know, and I just let you have to put that in the showing notes. The somebody will be home. Please yeah. don't mind them. Please don't ask them a million questions because they don't know. Bring all questions to me, but please don't mind them. Yeah, that's 
That's sad. That's that's sad. I don't I don't want to dwell on that too much longer because that that I don't like that. I don't like that at all. It's okay, reality, let's move forward. I'm sorry. <laughs> That is crazy to me. Uh, okay, so Denver, from what I've recently saw, they actually experienced a tech boom in recent years. Mm-hmm. A lot of technology companies come in there, which is good. Can you share a story about working with a client who was specifically relocating to the metro Denver area for that tech job opportunity? And how does your professional needs impact their preferences? Or how did their professional needs impact their preferences in terms of property location? So I've, done, I've had a lot. And there's not a story that stands out. It's more so a situation. When they're moving here for tech jobs, they're generally engineers of some sort, Mm high-level engineers. Nobody moves for a low-level job. Um, Oh, yeah. These are high-level engineering jobs. And when you're dealing with engineers, they are data-based. I've learned that I have to (laughs) spreadsheet almost everything for them. They want to see homes based on data. That's, that's Listen, <laughs> Krista, I've had another, that's so funny. I've had another guest on the show that talked about engineers and they, I don't want to say they talked bad about them, but no. they, they talked about like the demand and difficulty that, it, that you have to go through with these, with these clients because they are very technical, very mm-hmm. analytical, very, you know, numbers driven. I have a friend who's an engineer and he's the exact same way. Yep. Sorry to cut you off, but that no, is crazy. Don't be sorry. <laughs> so most of the times they'll leave the home buying to the spouse. If there is a spouse, sometimes there's not a mm. spouse. It's not always a family moving. So if they're leaving it to the spouse, they still need to see the, the, um, the tech spouse needs to see the spreadsheet so they can tell the choosing spouse what the options are. Here's, you get to choose, right, right. but here's what you get to choose from. <laughs> and I take that person out to look at homes. <laughs> that's so interesting they make it seem like they have the power listen this is what we're actually looking for these specific specs now you go out there and apply that and see what you can find that's right that is so crazy to me <laughs> that's interesting but yeah about the engineering thing that is i laughed because that's literally not the first time i've heard that uh-huh. and i mean it like we said it's not to say that they're they're difficult or anything like that, but all clients are demanding in some type of degree. There's nothing negative attached to that. No. But I, I know engineer, I have a few friends, close friends who are engineers and they are literally the exact same way. You have to break everything down almost to the simplest form. Yes. And I, and I get it. I get it. I love that though. That is so crazy. Krista, I don't know if you yourself um, have any experience with this. But I know some agents like to provide gifts to their clients, uh, you know, after they close is, you know, celebratory um, gesture. But have you yourself or anyone that, you know, given a gift that you felt was very elaborate? And can you talk about that, please? Ooh, elaborate is subjective. Um, It is. We have a closing table gift. It's funny. Depending on our client's humor, which is usually kind of dark like mine. Um, oh, wow. So my bags are little houses, the little paper bag um, shaped like houses. And inside we have all this um, easy to put together food. It's usually just add water, just add sour cream, mm. or just add a beer. Easy stuff, which makes moving into a new home so you can focus on unpacking and whatnot make meals real easy and that's the whole idea Mm. plus in there is a cup that says homeowner um and then there's one that says mother effing homeowner oh okay (laughs) (laughs) they get one of those and they love these silly little mugs but it makes their it makes them smile so that's my closing table gift Mm -hmm. elaborate gifts can be anything from a home warranty to um buying a water heater to Ooh, wow. babysitting for date night, to dog sitting while my client is moving out of the state and then putting the dog on the airplane to go meet the homeowner. I've done things like that. So my closing gifts, my elaborate closing gifts are not always material. Sometimes it's service. Uh, yeah, you just said babysit for date night. That's the one that stuck out. I mean, right after you said purchase a, a water heater, which I thought was 
a, a lot, but then you went right into babysitting for date night. I feel like that over that Trump that <laughs> that is going above and beyond. Yes. <laughs> Talk about service to others. Yeah, yeah, you are a better human being than me. This is why you are built for that position. Because I'm looking like babysit your kid. Like I don't want to even be put in that position. But I shout out to you for that, Krista, because that just goes to show how much of a people's person you are. The the rapport that you build with your clients and relationships because they're not going to let anybody just right. babysit their kid even if you did sell them a house you're not just about to babysit my my kid so that just shows that you built that relationship with them throughout that transaction to the, to the point that they trusted you yes which which speaks volumes to your personality and character by the way i just Thank want you. to highlight that i see that your brokerage participates and hosts Different events locally, say uh, adult swim night, which sounds very, very fun, by the way. Customer Appreciation Day. Can you talk about these events and can you share a story on the relationship that you possibly built with a patron at one of these events that eventually turned into a client? Yeah. So it's not the brokerage. We as agents get to decide what we participate oh. in. And I love okay. doing events. I love meeting people. This is my prospecting. I might not make 50 phone calls a day. But I'm out doing events and I'm meeting those people. And those are the people who I follow mm. up with. And because they see me out in the community and they see my business partner, Terry, out in the community hosting these and being present, they know we're going to be present when they need us for consultations, for mm -hmm. um, buying, for selling, for referring out. They know they're referring people or dealing with people who show up. Nice, nice. I, I'm sorry about that. I didn't know it was uh, it was an individual thing. I didn't know it, rather than That's a broker's okay, thing. I'm but sorry. but but that still speaks volumes to your character and your hustle. Yes. Also, that instead of making those cold calls where you're not face to face and you know things of that nature, you are face to face, belly to belly in the streets with the people, shaking hands, kissing babies, or babysitting babies, <laughs> and you're actually out there making those uh, those leads and getting those clients. I like that. I like that because I I love to talk to agents who are at a point where they are you know actively recruiting or, or prospecting I should say mm -hmm. and hearing the different methods I literally had a guest on not too long ago who lit, cold calling was part of his routine mm -hmm. it was part of his routine and to some people they like I am not doing any cold calling it's strictly social media for me some people strictly Zillow but you face to face with the people I, I used like to that work approach. in a call center so I have an issue cold calling people. oh yeah oh <laughs> me too come on now me too actually <laughs> I'm gonna be honest I used to do the same thing so I get it I get it nice I have what I feel like is a, a very valuable question for you Krista I want to know throughout your career looking back what are some key lessons that you've learned about yourself the industry and the importance of serving others well, the first thing I've learned about myself is I'm a people person. If you would have known me while I was in the tech field for 19 and a half years, you would not have thought I was a people person. Um, mm. I was a cranky person is really but um, who I was. But I'm realizing that it was the work and the workload and uh. that made me cranky. I don't mm. mind working hard. I mind working hard when I'm carrying people who aren't working hard. That bugs me. And that's what I love about this industry. I don't have to carry anybody but myself. Mm. And um, I am very much a people person. I love people. I love, I love people to the point where I can appreciate my time to myself. I know when my patience is running thin, so I know to withdraw from the field. I know when my energy is great, so that's when I need to be in the field. Mm. I've learned a lot about myself. Knowledge of self, love that. What about you have anything to speak on about what you've uh, learned about the industry and the importance of serving service mm. and others? <laughs> the industry is a living, breathing creature. Anybody who thinks it's not is delusional. <laughs> Um, when I entered the industry just over nine years ago, we were in a highly competitive market. Interest rates were about five to six percent. There were 30 offers on homes. We'd show up to a home and it looked like a party going on because there were so many people looking at the homes. Um, mm. Very, very competitive 
market at that time. And then we got into the low interest rates with, um, because the interest rates were so low and now everybody wants to buy a home, that, drew, yep. that drove up the demand, which drove up the prices of the homes. Um, mm -hmm. I will mm -hmm. admit that gives me a little bit of guilt in the industry, knowing that people are paying these prices for these homes. And, you know, for, I put people in homes where it's been two families or multi-generational in homes that are not meant for two families or multi-generational living um, right, right. because of the, of the way the, um, the home prices are just due to demand. Mm -hmm. And now that the interest rate's gone up, um, the demand is even lower, but the inventory is low. But for the buyers who are willing to utilize this time as that magic moment, they, it puts them back in control. And I like that too. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. See, that's, that's interesting you brought that up. I, I glanced over an article uh, in the National Association of Realtors that spoke on multi generational homes being it, it more popular nowadays. And with the increase uh, in, in the, the pricing of homes, I, I get it. I get it 100%. Mm -hmm. But. That is that is a that is interesting. That is very very interesting that you're actually seeing that firsthand. Oh yeah, and noticing that. So, and I like the fact that you compare it the industry to a living breathing creature because it's yes. continuously evolving yes. and and becoming something else. And I mean, yeah, there are cycles. Don't get me wrong. Right. But uh, you you never know when the cycles are going to come. You never know what's going to happen when the cycle arrives exactly. So. Very, very interesting perspective right there, Krista. And we want to thank you so much. Thank you for all of that knowledge. Thank you for pulling up a chair to the closing table. We love you, Krista. At this point, if you have any last words and or want to tell people how to reach out to you, please do so now. I always offer free consultations. Um, I always believe your next move should be an investment in your future. Let's talk about what that looks like, not just right now, but five years and 10 years from now, because that will help with your decision right now. Um, to reach out to me, you can contact me or my um, business partner, Terry, at kristamadrid.com. All of our information is on there. Easy peasy, just have to remember my name. Nice. Love it. Love it. Thank you again, Crystal. We appreciate it. For our YouTube audience watching right now, that's you. Yes, you. If you've gotten to this point in the episode where I am saying the sentence that I'm saying, please do us both a favor and hit the like button, please. And thank you. We appreciate that. Make sure you also share the content and subscribe to our channel. And if you are listening, mic check one, two on Apple, Spotify, or any other podcast platforms, please do the same. Give us a like, a five star rating and subscribe for our latest content. Hey, Crystal, you know what I like to do before we leave i like to leave the audience with the question to get their brains turning so this is for you audience before you leave the chat what factor is the most important when evaluating a property you're interested in the neighborhood the nearby school the commute to work or the local attractions don't tell us now leave it in the comments below besides that we'll talk to you next time